All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about chapter 13 today. Um, so chapter 13, we're building on the things that we've learned in previous chapters, um, and we're going to define two important words. We're going to define savings, we're going to define investment, and we're going to talk about this thing called the financial system. So um, remember a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the production function for our country um, we gave it a shape and a kind of a slight functional form last week. We said that GDP for our total country is equal to the amount of technology times some function that takes as inputs labor, capital, human capital or human resources, and natural resources, right? And then, of course, we also said, well, in the per person or per laborer term, remember productivity, this is what Y over L is. This is this plain old Y is how much GDP is in the entire country. GDP divided by the number of laborers is how much GDP each of the people is making, each of the workers is making. So we call that our productivity. And that's equal to the amount of technology times some function, which we're not exactly sure about. But, um, and it takes as inputs the amount of capital per person, the amount of human capital per person, and the amount of natural resources per person. Now, why are we interested in this? Well, because don't forget that really what we want is living standards for people to be higher. And what is our best kind of guess at how people are doing? Well, it's this kind of GDP per capita idea. And the fact of the matter is, is that an individual's productivity is directly correlated with their standard of living. So if we can get the productivity for a person to go up, for one of the laborers, meaning if we can get them to make more things, more goods and services, if we can make Y over L go up, then we know that we're going to make the living standard go up. Okay? It's the, the, the closest determinant that we know of in this class so far to people's living standard is how productive they are. Okay, So that's why we wrote this production function like this, because we know that as we increase the amount of capital per laborer, right, that has got a positive effect on productivity. Right? So if I increase capital per laborer, it's going to make uh, productivity per laborer go up. If I increase human capital per laborer, it's going to make productivity go up. If I increase natural resources per laborer, it's going to make productivity go up. Okay? So remember, we talked about that a bit in, in the previous chapter. This is kind of hard to change, natural resources per labor. These things perhaps easier to change, physical capital per labor and, and human capital per labor. Okay? And so if you remember what we talked about how to, let's focus on cap, physical capital per labor right now. Um, if we want to make this go up, one of the things we can investigate is how to make capital per labor go up. So let's remember, think about what we have to do. We can't get rid of laborers, which would make this term go up, right? If I made laborers go down, then this would go up. This would go up. That's probably, you know, mass slaughter of laborers, not a really good idea uh, for the country as a whole. But look at what the other option is. I can make K go up, right? And, and K is the amount of capital that is in my economy. So I can make capital go up. And if you remember back from our chapter on GDP, um, it's called investment whenever I purchase a building or a machine or anything that I use as physical capital, right? It's called investment. And so um, anything that is a productive input to the, the production process, right? So anything that I can buy and it helps as an input to make more goods, that's what we're going to think of as capital. And anytime I make a purchase of that capital, it's called investment. Right? So this is different, and I'm going to hit this a couple times this chapter, but this idea of investment is way different than maybe perhaps what you guys thought was the word investment before you came into my class. You might be like, oh, well, I took some money and I put it in, a, in the savings account. I invested it in the mutual fund or something like that. Right? That's a different for form of investment, and it's not actually what we're going to call investment in this class. We're going to call investment only when I make purchases of productive capital. Okay? And I can, I can make a purchase of K, which will make K over L go up, or I can make a purchase of H, which is human capital. Right? I can make an investment in human capital, which will make H over L go up. All right? So the idea here for this chapter is we're looking for increases in K over L and H over L, which is 
capital per laborer and um, human capital per laborer because we want y over l to go up. And so that's investment. Now, this is word saving is what we're going to define from here on out as anything left over at the end of the time period that you didn't eat up. Okay, so let's say that you get paid $100 a day, right? And during the course of that day, you use up $90 to, I don't know, for food, for purchases, to, to buy things, to maybe you went to the store, right? And there's $10 left over at the end of the day. That's what we're going to call as savings. Whatever's left over, when you take some income and then you subtract off whatever expenditures you have, whatever's left over is saving. Now you can take that saving and you can put it in a bank, you could put it under your mattress, you could put it in a stocks and bonds, you could put it in any number of other financial instruments, right? But we're going to call that saving, not investment, okay? Clearly they're sort of related, right? Because in order to be able to buy some physical capital, I, had, I have to get money that somebody else saved, right? And so then we have this, this, uh, this need for help between my savers and my investors, right? The savers are the people who at the end of the day didn't spend all their money, and so they have extra money left over. The investors are the people who need that savings, are going to put that into buying buildings or machines or tractors or stuff like that. And so then the people who help the savers find the investors, we call that the financial system, all right? So kind of as a, as a brief summary of what we're going to do in this class today, we're going to ask, what are the main types of these financial institutions in the US economy? And what is their function, right? The function is always to match the savers with the investors, the people who have the extra money left over with the people who need that extra money to, to purchase uh, capital, all right? So we're going to talk about the, what are the financial institutions in the US economy. Um, we're going to talk about three different kinds of savings, depending upon who does the savings, all right? Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but we'll talk about it even more. Remember, the difference between saving and investment. I try to hit this really hard because especially this is one of your first economics classes, and most people come in thinking investment means putting money in the bank, right? And that's, we're going to call that savings in this, in this class. And for the rest of your economics classes, we're going to call investment only when we make productive purchases of human or physical capital. Um, how does this financial system match up savers and investors? We're going to call that coordinating investment, okay? And then finally, what kind of government policies can we implement that's going to increase the level of saving, the level of investment, and, the, and change the interest rate, right? Because remember, the goal of, of something the government could do, the scope of government in, in intervention could be to raise K over L or raise H over L because both of these, if we raise this, we know that productivity, Y over L, is going to go up. Okay, so we'll use um, the idea that we want to increase Y over L uh, by increasing either K over L or, or H over L, and we'll look at you know, the different government policies that um, can affect that. Okay, so first, these financial institutions, these guys who match up savers and investors, let's talk about them. In general, uh, we refer to it as the financial system. That's just kind of the general term for all of the things that match up the savers with the investors. The savers, remember, are the people with the money at the end of the day, and the investors are the people who are going to take extra money and build productive capital. Okay. Um, and so, in general, we call it the financial system anything that helps match a saver with uh, an investor. Okay. And there's two types of uh, two main broad categories in the financial system. There's financial markets and financial intermediaries. First, we're going to talk about financial markets. So financial markets are the most simple piece, I, 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 perhaps, I think, at least to understand. They're the most simple piece of the financial system. Okay? It looks like this. Okay? You have a saver. And he has got money left over at the end of the day. And he's going to send that money to somebody who's going to do investment. In general, we think the people who do investment 
are like firms, factories, right? People who need to purchase um, capital. So we'll draw a little firm. There's its smokestack. And they're going to send them, let's say they send them $90, OK? Uh, because this, this guy has $90 left over. He's a saver. This is the investor. He's going to, remember, this is not like we think of investor, like a guy who plays stocks and bonds in the market. No, we're going to think of a person who's going to build some capital, right? So here's the investor. And there are two main ways for individuals to contribute directly to the investors. These are called financial markets. Anytime when the savers talk to the investors or the borrowers directly, we'll call that a financial market. And the first one is, that's well, pretty well known is called the bond market. Okay? And in what's called a bond, all right, the person sends, say, perhaps $90 to the investor, and obviously the investor has to give the saver something back, right? And so what they give them is what's called an IOU, <laughs> right? You guys know what an IOU is, right? I owe you money, <laughs> right? But the key here is that the amount of the IOU is gonna be for some amount greater than $90. That's the point, right? So maybe they're like, oh, I'll pay you back $100 in one year. If you give me $90 now and I invest and I build some machines, then over the course of the year those machines are going to make a lot of goods, I'm going to get some profit out of them and I will go ahead and return you the profit in the form of an IOU of $100. Okay? So this is called the bond market. And a bond, the um, saver makes money because the IOU is more than they gave. This is a real simple way to, to, to think about it. Okay, In the bond market, and this is just how it works, is that the saver is making money because the saver needs to doesn't want to just give his money to the investor. Because let's be honest, this saver could buy a couple more tacos from Taco Bell and be happier if he just kept this $90, right? So we have to kind of provide some sort of incentive. Remember one of the big principles of this course, people respond to incentives. We have to provide some incentive for the saver to send his money to the investor, right? And the thing is, is that uh, the investor is going to pay back an IOU. All, all a bond is is a little piece of paper that says IOU 100 bucks, okay? And, uh, and so they send $90. In some point in time in the future, they get more money. Let's call it $100. And that's how the saver makes money on the bond market. Okay. Um, now, if you imagine that this is perhaps like a very well-known company and it's, it, everybody thinks they're going to be very profitable, right? And the company says, well, I have some IOUs for $100 I'm going, to, um, I'm going to give away. You can imagine that people are like, oh, this is a really good place to put my money because it's high probability that I'm going to get this $100 back. And so they might try to you know, fight for the, the privilege of buying these IOUs. Well, this will make the price go up of the IOUs, right? So you actually have to spend more and more money, which means that if this price goes up, people you know, try to bid them up and this price goes up to $95, well now you're making less money, right? You're only making the five extra dollars. But the reason why people were trying to bid on up, the, up, the, up the price of these is because this is thought to be a very worthwhile or very productive uh, firm. Okay, so if this is a firm that's likely to do well, it's likely to pay back, there's very little risk, right? Because you're like, if I'm going to give them money, of course they're going to give it back, right? Um, on the flip side, on the flip side, if this is some new techno technology startup in, in Silicon Valley and there's only like a 50% chance it's even going to be existing the next year, right? That's super risky. Because if the company goes under, what happens to your IOU? Do you get it back? No, right? So you're going to see the price of the bonds fall for these risky startups. Okay? You might only have to pay $40 for the $100 IOU because you're like, mm, it's likely I'm just going to lose my 
original uh, savings that I put in because the company's no longer any good. Okay, so that's called the bond market. It's nothing more than a certificate of indebtedness from from the company directly to the saver. So this very simple procedure here is known as a financial market. It's known as the bond market. Simple and plain, it just takes money from the savers and gives it to the investors who need it. Okay, And the other type of kind of direct, see because these, these guys are dealing directly with each other, right? The other kind of direct dealing, which you guys are aware, well aware of probably, is also the stock market. Okay, So the stock market is slightly different. Okay. I'm going to just make it very, very simple. In the stock market, again, you have a saver. They have extra money at the end of the time period. They need to send it to the investor, the factory. But the only difference between this, the bond market and the stock market is what you get out of it. Okay. In a bond market, they just send you the IOU. In the stock market, they send you a share of the company. In essence, they divide up this company, I don't know, into like 12 pieces, and they give you one of them, right? They give you a piece of the company, is basically what a stock is. It's a, it's a claim to ownership. You say, okay, I contributed this money and I bought a stock, and now I own one twelfth of the company. I am now an owner of the company. Okay? So the stock in stocks you make money the saver makes money two ways. Saver makes money two ways. Okay? The first is they have a productive asset. They actually own a piece of the company, which they can sell at a later date. Right? They own a productive asset. Part of the company. Okay. The other way, though, is this company hopefully is making profits, right? When the company makes profits, what it does is it splits it up to all of the owners. Okay. And who are the owners? The people who own all these little stocks or these little shares. Okay. So. When they, when they take the profit and they divide it up amongst all the shareholders, then every shareholder gets a little bit of money, right? And that's called a dividend payment, which is a share of the profit. Okay? So this you can get every year or every quarter, or maybe even every month, depending upon how the company pays out its profits, you can get a dividend every so often, right? Every year, or every month, or whatever it is. Um, this, you only get to get your money back if you go ahead and sell the piece of the company that you, uh, that you own, right? This doesn't pay money all the time. This can pay money all the time, all right? Now, not every share is like this. Some shares uh, don't pay dividends, some do, some pay dividends more often than not. But this is kind of like the general idea of how the stock market works. You directly pay money to the investor and they give you something back for it. They give you a chunk of their company, right? They give you a piece of the company. Now, some people really like this idea because if they send a lot of money, they get to buy a bunch of shares of the company. And if they own more shares than anybody else, they're like the majority owner. And they can have like power to be able to say, no, we need to change the company and do something different, right? So sometimes people in, uh, who are very sophisticated, uh, um, people who are in the stock market, they send a lot of money, buy a big chunk of a company, and then they can control the company, right? And so they like to do this because they're like, well, I know how to run a company really well. So then maybe they make the profits of the entire company go up, which since they are the majority owner, then they benefit as well. Okay, so that's how the, that's how the stock market works. But both of these, the stock market and the bond market, have um, a a risk, right? If this company goes 
down, if it goes under, if it goes out of business, you don't get anything out of it and you lose your original savings. Okay? So because of that problem, there arose a second type of uh, branch in the financial system. So remember, there's financial markets where you, you deal directly with the investors. Then there's the second sidebar, which are known as financial intermediaries. So you just deal with the middleman, and the middleman deals with the investors. Okay? So that's going to change our picture slightly. Okay, so now the picture looks like this. I got my saver, and he's going to contribute his money, but he doesn't contribute it directly to the investors. He contributes it to the financial intermediary. Let's say he contributes $90, okay? And the financial intermediary, perhaps, is called a bank, right? You guys are, are well aware of this, I'm sure. Well, what does a bank do? Well, you contribute to the intermediary, and so do a bunch of other savers, right? There's a bunch of other savers out here that are also contributing money to the bank. The bank takes all of your money, and then it deals directly with the investors themselves, right? So the intermediary sends money to these investors, the companies that, are, that need them, in the form of loans, right? And then the, the uh, Investors pay the bank back some, some percentage of their money, right? And then you go ahead and get some percentage less than this percentage, right? Let's say they are paying back 7% on their dollar. The bank maybe takes a, a little bit of it to exist itself, but then you only get back, say, 3% on your dollar or something like that. And that's, that is the way that we generate savings with a financial intermediary. So a couple, so some people might look at this and be like, well, why am I paying extra money to the middleman, right? Because you don't get the full amount of money out of it when it goes through the bank, right? The, the bank takes its profit margin and takes its cut off the top and gives you what's left. If you look at these generally, these investors, they're paying business loans perhaps 8 or 9% to the bank. And if you look at the amount of savings in your, the percentage rate in your savings account, it's probably like 1%, <laughs> right? So we're going from 8% to 1%. Somebody's swallowing this up. You're like, why, why would I ever do this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's pretty hard to, for me and you, so why would I do this? Well, first of all, it's pretty hard for me and you, especially if we don't know a lot about companies or a lot about these, these firms, to be able to pick the good firms and not pick the bad firms, right? When you leave your average person to just pick, you and I, who maybe are not specialized in the kind of firms that these are, we don't know what's a good firm and what's a bad firm. So what we depend on is the people in the bank, the people who make the loans, they're called underwriters, and they're, they specialize in looking at firms. And they can tell, okay, I see that this is going to be a good productive firm, so I'm going to put my money here, and this firm is not a good productive firm, so they don't end up giving them a loan. Right? So what it does is though, even though you might get a smaller percent than you would have if you contracted with these firms directly, it helps prevent loss. Right? You, you don't have to worry about the companies going under. Because it, one, the bank's probably only going to pick good, good companies. And two, even if one of the companies does go under, remember your money is coming from a bunch of different other companies, right? the, the pay back to you. that. Um, the, the pay that you're receiving. So this intermediary performs a very beneficial role, okay? They make it less risky, less risky for the saver to contribute money. Most of us, I think, feel very confident in putting money into a bank in the savings account. We don't think we're going to lose it. Whereas if you and I were to imagine putting money in the stock market, Believe me, <laughs> we're all sort of afraid that we're going to lose it, right? So this uh, gives us a bit of a, a kind of assurance or, or makes it less risky. Really what it does is it increases the amount of savings that people contribute to the financial system, right? Without banks, people would give a lot less savings. Well, that would be a bummer because then there would be a lot less money for investment. And remember, if investment is low, if K over L is low, then Y over L is low, right? So these are really important intermediaries in our market because they help more people contribute to savings. 
Okay, there's one other example of a financial intermediary. There's actually a, quite a, diff, a few of them, but uh, they're called mutual funds. And so this is very, very similar. Um, you contribute money to the mutual fund, and then the mutual fund, instead of making loans to the banks, or excuse me, making loans to the factories, they send out money and they get back shares or stocks. And then the mutual fund pays you some percentage back. Okay, So that's how a mutual fund is different than a bank. Whereas a bank sends out money, we call them loans, and then gets, gets uh, some sort of payment back. Um, a mutual fund sends out money to buy shares of, of these firms. Just like when you as an individual were buying the stocks or the shares of, this, um, of these firms, now you just go through a mutual fund and do it. Now, why would you do that? Because clearly, the amount of money that the mutual fund gets, they keep a little bit of it, and then they see, send some to you, right? So why would you go through a mutual fund? Well, the reason is, it's the risk thing again, right? You and I are not sophisticated investors. We're not sophisticated factory owners. We can't really pick which firm is going to do better, right? But there's these guys, they're mutual fund managers, fund managers, and they are sophisticated. They have been doing this for a long time. Maybe they've just got lucky, I don't know. But maybe, yeah. maybe they're skilled. Maybe they, they're skilled investors, right? And maybe they know which, which of these investors is going, to, is going to really pay the dividend, right? And so that's the thought. When you're paying extra money for maintenance fees for your mutual funds, the money you're paying is for the investment advice, the savings advice, of the mutual fund managers and, and you um, purchase uh, a bunch of different ones, right? And then it's true, one of these companies was probably going to have a bad year or maybe go out of business, but because you don't own this company directly, you, you don't have a share of this firm, you own a piece of the mutual fund which owns the shares, it only makes your total savings go down just a little bit when one firm goes out of business. Does that make sense? So it spreads the risk around. So these share, this, the share of this company is still valid, the share of this company is still valid, it's just this company that went out of business, right? So it's not that big of a loss as if you had bought the, the company directly. Okay, so again, financial intermediary, the mutual fund, play, playing a very important role in uh, helping increase savings, right? We want to increase savings. Why? Because the more savings that go into the financial system, the more investment these investors can make, and that's bigger K over L, which makes bigger Y over L, which is better off for everybody. That's the general idea of why these financial intermediaries are a good idea, right? I want to, I want to take for a second and just point out one other thing that these intermediaries can buy. So let's imagine, go back to imagine the bank. Right? Let's call this the financial intermediary that's the bank. I put my money in there as a saver. They make loans out to investors, but they might also make loans out to people to buy houses. This is very common, right? When you and I go buy a house, we get money from the bank. Okay? And so this is the exact same idea. It doesn't really change much. Remember, we think of houses, for the terms of macroeconomics, we think of houses as little factories that produce a good called housing, right? So um, if I purchase a house, the purchase price of the house, remember, is investment, right? And then every single year, they produce some good, my little house factory, the good is called housing, or the service is called housing, and then I pay for that with my rental, I rent that from the house every single year, and that goes into the consumption portion of my GDP, right? But the actual physical purchase price of houses is called investment because it is like a productive investment in a factory. It's a house, it makes, it makes, it makes housing. Okay, so the bank 
gives money to these people who are buying houses as well as the firms. Okay? Well, a couple of years ago, 2005, 2006, we saw something. It was called the housing bubble. What happened? These houses started rising in price very, very quickly. Why? Because the demand for houses was going up. Remember that, here, this will be kind of hard to see, but when the, uh, the demand curve increases, what happens to the price? This was the old price. This was the new price. It goes up, right? So all of a sudden, banks started making too many loans to too many bad uh, homeowners to buy houses. Well, because there was all this extra money in the house world, in the world of buying houses, all the prices shot up, right? So then people were taking out all kinds of money from the bank, buying them, uh, buying houses, but the amount of production that was coming out of these houses was, was very little. They weren't actually worth that much, okay? And so the problem was the banks, they, I'm not going to get too much into it, but they were, uh, they were making really bad loans to people that shouldn't get loans to buy houses. And they were using tricky rules and, and different ways of packaging the loans up and sending them to other countries to have other people own, own the loans, right? So they're like, oh, I'll make a loan to this person, but then they'll just pass it off to someone else so that they knew that the, the person would default on their mortgage, but it wouldn't be them. It would be some other person in another country. This is what was happening, right? But the banks, they were making these bad loans. And the, the price of the houses were shooting up, right? And so they went up high, super, super high. And somewhere around 2007, 2008, the bubble is called popped, right? It became, people started not being able to afford their mortgage payments because they were bad. Uh, they should never have gotten loans in the first place, right? And this is a big, huge problem because why do we put money in the bank? Because we trust these guys that they're not going to give out loans to bad companies or bad investors or bad homes, right? But they did. Unfortunately, they did. So all of the bad, you know, people who shouldn't have gotten a loan stopped paying their loans, right? And so then all of these uh, loans weren't worth anything to the bank anymore. So the bank still owed the people the money, but they weren't getting any, they weren't getting any, any income back into them because they were, they were making, they had made all these bad loans. So stuff started to collapse. And that is the beginning of what we call the Great Recession, 2008 or so. Um, and here's, I'm going to do a brief couple of slides kind of trying to explain it and help you understand why it was caused by the financial system. Okay? Um, these slides might not be in your handout, I, but I just want to show you a little bit about how the financial system ended up ruining caused, I don't know, this, this financial crisis, okay? So I, I throw up a couple of employment rates right here, not because we're studying employment rates at all, this chapter, but because um, I want to show you that it was a recession. And what's one of the ways that we indicate when a country has a recession? One of the indicators is we look at their unemployment rates, right? So when unemployment rates shoot up all at the same time, right here at the end of 2000, was that midway to the end of 2008? This is quarterly data, right? So this is January 20, 2007, April 2007, J July 2007, October 2007, and then it starts again. Um, you see all of a sudden unemployment rates start to shoot up, right? In every country, right? United States, France, United Kingdom, Canada, and Sweden. Um, by the way, Canada has had the, the least problems of all with unemployment. Just our happy neighbors to the north, maybe they're doing something right up there, I don't know. But um, so it shot up all the way right here. So we should investigate. We know that there's some sort of a, a recession or some problem happening right here, right? That's why I showed the unemployment rates. So we need to investigate what was going on during that time period, right? What was going on with the financial system? OK, so asset prices went down, particularly homes, right? House prices in 2008 fell 30%. So we have this bubble popping. Why is the bubble popping? We have to take one step back. Why was there a bubble in the first place? <laughs> there was a bubble in the first place because everybody was getting loans to buy houses. So everybody's you know, bidding on houses and that's bidding the prices up, 
right? Well, some of those people who were in the bidding process shouldn't have been in there because the banks should have known better and should never have lent them money, okay? So there's too many people bidding on too many houses. Well, when those people who can't afford those houses fall out of the market, what happens? There's no one left to bid against, so the house prices fall, okay? So the banks, they own these houses. They've given loans for a million dollar house and all of a sudden now the house is worth $700,000. This is a big problem because they got a million dollars from savers to, to loan out the money for this million dollar house. Now they gotta turn around and tell, talk to their savers and be like, oh, remember that a million dollars that you gave us? It's only worth 700,000 right now, right? So people are not super happy. Asset prices are falling as more uh, people, as more houses start falling, their prices start falling, the banks start freaking out and saying, oh, I'm not going to make any more loans for houses right now because I just got big time burned, right? Well, what does that do? There's no money. If I want to go buy a house, even if I'm a good, a good person to loan money to, I can't get money from the bank, which means I can't go to the auction and bid the price of houses up. So what does the house prices start doing even more? They start falling even more because now even the good people can't get money out of the bank, right? And so people can't get money out of the bank, so people start going to um, the banks. They can't pay their money. They can't pay the savers back for the money that the that they lost on these homes, right? So banks and other institutions failed when the homeowner stopped paying. Because these homeowners never should have gotten a loan in the first place. The banks, they were not doing their job. Remember, their job was to only pick good, trustworthy people to loan money to, but they didn't, right? So people stopped paying. So what did the savers do? Did they start thinking bank was a good place to put their money anymore? No. They started pulling their money out. They're saying, wait a second here. I gave you money because I thought you were going to invest in productive assets. You gave it to people who shouldn't have it for these houses. Now the, the home prices have collapsed, so my original savings is not worth what it is. I'm going to go ahead and pull out my little bit of money that's left right now. Okay. Well, that makes the banks come to a grinding halt because the banks don't have money of their own. They just use money from the savers, right? Okay. So everybody started pulling their funds out of the financial institutions. Um, about this time, the, the government was like, oh my goodness, people are pulling money out of the bank. So they um, increased this thing called federal deposit insurance. Um, I don't know if you know this, but if you put money in a bank uh, up to $100,000 and, and, the, and the bank has a problem, before this time, up to $100,000, the United States government would step in and give you money, right? That was like the government trying to say, okay, we know we need banks, and if people start sucking their money out of the banks, then we're in a big problem, right? Because we need this to produce K over L. Then they went ahead and was like, wait, wait, don't stop taking your money out of the banks. We're going to increase to $250,000, the, the United States government did. So they now insure, if you put money in a bank, up to $250,000, that even if the bank goes out of business, you can still go to the United States government and get your $250,000 back. Okay? So that helped a little bit, except for many, many people, especially wealthy people, the people who, who are doing most of the savings, have more than $250,000 in a bank okay? or in some form of financial um, institutions. So that's why I have written here the uninsured deposits, the things that are above the limits people started taking out, right? So it didn't really help all that much. Um, and so then there was the thing called the credit crunch. Now what is that? The banks, they realize they're in trouble. They stop making loans for houses because they're like, last time we did this, we made loans to people who we shouldn't have and uh, it really hurt us, okay? So they stop making loans for any houses. <laughs> That's called a credit crunch. Uh, even the people who were well qualified and should be getting loans, the banks were scared and they didn't give anyone loans, right? So now there's no one to buy houses at all. So since there's no one bidding up the price, what happens? The house prices fall even more, which ends up hurting the banks even more because they still have loans out for the other houses, right? This is kind of like a, like a, a swirl, right? So the lenders, these are the banks, the troubled lenders, the banks that were having troubles, were not confident in the borrower's creditworthiness. They're like, whatever system that we had that was supposedly uh, figuring out if people were good, target, good recipients for loans was not working. So until we fix it, we're just not going to make any loans out, right? 
And so then this whole process then led to an economic downturn. So it, at first it was just in the um, house market, right, in the loans for the homes market, but then it spread to the rest of the economy because these banks aren't just making um, loans to houses, they're also making loans to firms, to factories, to these guys who are doing investment, right? Well, when they stopped making loans, it didn't just affect the housing market. Now it starts to affect the, um, the, these firms. So the firms can't get loans to, to produce things, which they need, right? The firms need, the, need, need these loans. So we got not only the banks, which are failing, and their money is, uh, their productive capacity is going down, so GDP is going down, but including the investors now don't have any money, so their contribution to GDP is going down. So the whole economy starts sliding down together, okay? And that, meant, that made GDP fall, and that's how the unemployment rose, right? Okay, so when these firms stopped, they didn't have access to money because of the credit crunch, because the banks were fa failing, uh, they couldn't hire new workers because they couldn't build new factories to put the workers in, okay? And that's why the unemployment rate rose. Remember that graph I showed you a couple of slides back? That, that, that was the first time when people started triggering and seeing, oh man, this is a bit of a problem, right? The people as a whole, I think, maybe the government. There were plenty of um, smart investors who, by the way, got their money out before because they could see this coming. Right? They're like, oh, these banks are making loans to these houses that should not happen, right? So plenty of people pulled their money out before, but um, the majority of people did not, okay? So then we have this falling GDP, and then it just repeats itself in this vicious cycle, right? So the downturn is reducing profits, so the profits are falling from here, which makes GDP altogether fall, which makes, since there's, now there's no, the, everybody's GDP is falling, does anybody have any money to save to put in the banks? No, right? So once GDP is falling because there's no production, remember these guys are paying these people <laughs> and that's where the savings is coming from, right? So then once these fell, then there's no savings to be had at all. So the banks don't even have money to, to loan back out. And then the production here falls, which makes GDP fall again. And it's just this vicious cycle and it fell down. 2008, 2009, right? That happened for like two years. We're still kind of slowly digging our way out of that, right? But it was, it was a crazy time, right? Stuff just started falling all together because of the financial intermediaries, all right? So I, I have this whole couple of, of slides basically for one important reason. Financial intermediaries are really important, right? Really important. That's why the government started bailing out banks and, and there's this whole other side of craziness that happened during that period of time that some people agree with and many people disagree with that the government was like, oh my goodness, I can't let this bank fail because if I let this bank fail, then all these people who are getting loans from it are, are, are out to lunch and all of these companies are going to fail and then who knows how bad it's going to be, right? So they started, it was really kind of a, a, a big problem, they started pumping in money to these banks so that they would keep making loans. The problem was the whole thing started because the banks were making loans to bad people, right? So pumping money into this bank, they're going to go out. Who's to say they're not going to just make loans back to the bad people, the, the poor, the uncredit worthy borrowers again, right? So that's kind of like a, a 10 minute description of what happened in the Great Recession. Um, and really it all can't, comes down to these financial intermediaries. Okay. Let's uh, stop thinking about the historical downturn and let's kind of come back to the role of saving and investing. So we talked about saving in general. Let's focus on this saving a little bit closer and talk about the different types of savings that there are. Okay, first there's this thing called private saving. And it, this is the savings that we, me and you think about the person here that's sending money to the bank, okay? We call that private saving. It's the portion of household's income that is not used for consumption and not used for paying taxes. In other words, the amount of money that's left over at the end of the time period, that's private savings, 
Okay, private saving, the amount of money that's left over at the end of the time period. So private savings, let's think about what um, that is. In general, what's the measure of household's income? What do, what do I use for household's income? Over the entire economy, what, what letter do I use for income? GDP, right? We also call that Y, right? Households income over the entire country is Y, right? Remember, because of the circular flow diagram, Y is the amount of stuff that people make, but it's the also amount that people get paid. It's also the amount that uh, firms have in profit and wages and rent, right? So the circular flow diagram says, I can measure this amount at any place along the circular flow diagram, right? It's the money that the firms get. It's the amount of money the firms get. It's the amount of goods the firms make. It's the amount of income that the households get, right? So at any point in time, I want, it, want the household's income. It's always equal to the GDP, right? Well, let's think about how much of that is saved, right? If I spend money on a consumption good, that's not saved, right? What's the other thing in general that people spend money on in the households? It's consumption and it's also taxes, right? This right here, I have total income minus how much I spend for stuff, minus how much I paid for taxes. Whatever's left over, that's how much my households are saving, correct? You see that? So private savings is pretty easy. It just, in general, is I made some income. This is on the, on the scale of the whole economy, but you can think about it as one household, right? And all households are like very similar. I made some money. I spent some of it. I paid some taxes on it. And whatever's left over is equal to private savings. Right? That's how much my, my uh, my household is saving, right? So it's just, I made some income, I spent some money on taxes, and I spent some money on stuff. Whatever's left over is how much is available to save, right? Because that's just my definition of savings. It's just income minus whatever I spent it on, and whatever else, whatever I spent, okay? And so private individuals can save. The other person who can save is the government, and we call that public saving when it's the government, okay? Well, we call it public saving when it's the government. Public savings. Now, let's think through on the government's level, what is, okay, in general, saving is just income minus some expenditure, right? Now imagine that you're the government for a second. Income to the government, what's that called? Taxes, taxes right? So it's going to be some sort of income, which we'll call taxes, minus the expenditure that the government makes. And remember, back from the GDP chapter when we were counting it up, everything that the government spends, we call that G, right? That's how many dollars the government spends. So taxes minus the government spending, whatever's left over is how much the government saves, right? Does that make sense? We have the government's income minus the um, government spending. So, so on the government's le uh, side of things, it, can s it has income of taxes, but then it also spends some G, okay? So we have at least two types of savings right here. We have individuals in the households, they save, right? They get an income, they spend some on taxes, they spend some on, on consumption. Whatever's left over is available to save and is saved, right? They're not going to take it and throw it in the street or burn it or something like that, right? Every leftover dollar is saved. Uh, on, on the government, the same, same, same thing happens. They get some income and they spend some money and whatever's left over is how much the government saves. Okay, does that make sense? So, um, savings for my entire country, I just add these two things up, <laughs> right? Savings for my entire country 
equals how much households save plus how much the government saves. Okay, we call that national saving. Saving for my entire country is just how much household saves plus how much the government saves. So let's just add those together, right? This is, this is private saving, y minus t minus c. This is government saving, t minus g. Okay. So when I want to know how much was saved in the country as a whole, okay, and why do I want to do this? Because remember, the savers contribute money to the banks. So if I want to know how much money there is to be contributed to the financial system, I have to add up all of the national savings, right? And notice the T's cancel out, right? There's a subtracting a T and there's adding a T. So really it's just Y minus C minus G. This is how much is to be um, saved on the national level as a whole. And it, it really is quite simple, right? It's the total amount of money made, or the total amount of products made in the entire country, minus what we spent on stuff, minus what the government spent on stuff. Whatever's left over is how much is left to be saved and then invested, right? So this is very important, because my question is, how much leftover money is there that I can take and I can in put into investment? Because I want to increase investment because that increases productivity, right? So how much is left over? It's just this, however much people made in total minus how much they spent on stuff total minus how much the government spent on stuff in total. Whatever's left over is how much in the whole nation, the nation as a whole, is left to be invested, okay? And so basically it's, it's quite easy to, to remember. It's just the portion of national income why? That is not used for consumption and not used for government purchases. Okay, the portion of national income that is not used for consumption, not used for government purchases, that is left to be saved. And then, right, it gets saved and then it gets sent to through the financial system and it ends up getting invested. Okay, so we have this identity. This is easy to remember. that savings is equal to y minus c minus g. Total savings in the country is equal to y minus c minus g. All right? Now if you look at this, you might be like, mm, I think I've seen something like this before. And it's true, you have. Let's uh, remember what GDP is equal to. GDP in general, right, this is from a different chapter. This is. This is just from our brains. We just came up with this right now, right? This is what in savings is, is equal to. This is from a different chapter. This is from the chapter where we added up GDP, right? GDP is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports, OK? Now, I want you just for the rest of this chapter, just to make it easy, to imagine a closed economy. What does closed economy mean again? No trade. So how is this going to change if there's no trade? A C, I, and G. Exactly. There's no net export, so it's just going to be C, I, and G, right? Exactly. And this just makes it easy because if, one, exports are pretty small, actually, in comparison to the, the whole GDP of the country, so they can kind of be ignored. But also, um, if, if money is going out or into the country via the exports channel, this stuff's not going to all add up exactly. But just for the simple model that we're going to write, we're going to write that total income GDP is equal to just consumption, investment, and government spending. Well, let's go ahead and get I all by itself. And from this, what do we got? I equals Y minus C minus G. Whoa, that's exactly the same thing as I saw over here, right? I also equals y minus c minus g. Okay, We got these from two different places. We got this from our brains, thinking about what's left over to save in the country. We got this from adding up the GDP. Right? It just so happens that as savings is equal to y minus c minus g, and investment is equal to y minus c minus g. So then finally, my next step is that Savings is equal to investment. 
Savings is equal to investment. In other words, every single dollar that's saved in a closed economy with no trade has to get invested through the financial system. Okay? So every single dollar that's saved has to get invested through the financial system. So that's kind of cool because this tells us that if I want to increase investment, one of the things that I can do is increase savings. Exactly, right? So it gives me just another tool. Because remember, all I'm trying to do is increase Y over L. And the way I'm trying to do that is increase K over L. How do I increase K? Through investment. How can I increase investment? Through save, increasing savings, right? So it's just giving me more tools to try to help my economy out, right? And so um, we can go ahead and then split investment into national saving or private saving and public saving if you want. Um, but the key here to remember is that saving is equal to investment in the closed economy. Saving is equal to investment in the closed economy. And we got that from this, from this thing right here. Um, it's, it's also sometimes interesting to look at investment equaling this right here because you can ask, hey, well, what happens if uh, consumption goes down to investment? Well, if consumption goes down, this is subtracting. So that means investment itself is going to go up, for example. So if I can convince people, hey, stop buying so much stuff right now, <laughs> if I could do that, probably really difficult. But if I could do that, that would make investment go up, right? Which would make capital go up which would make capital over labor go up, K over L, which will make Y over L go up, which is what I want, right? So it gives us some more tools to try to affect this Y over L number, OK? And then, of course, um, uh, the big important thing from this slide is that also it's equal to savings. So I don't actually have to force people to invest more and to build more stuff. If I could just force people to save more, it will automatically go into investment. Right? It will go through the financial system. OK, so let's think about uh, a little bit of public saving on the government side right now. OK, let's think about this on the government side. Who remembers what government savings is? What, are the, what is it equal to? What minus what? Taxes minus the government spending. OK, so if I have more taxes than I do have government spending, well, that's a good thing for the budget. That means I have a budget surplus, T minus G. Right? This is going to be a positive number. If I take in more taxes, but I spend less than what I take in, that's called a budget surplus. We call that public saving. Right? When the government takes in more taxes than what it gives out, it's a budget surplus. Um, and that's, that's what we refer to as, as a budget surplus. Lately in the United States, has that been happening? No. We have this thing called a budget deficit. What happens there? It means that taxes are less than what you spend. Or, another way to think about it, you're spending more than the income that you get. It's kind of uh, bad math, right? Government spending is more than tax revenue. So that means this number T minus G is a negative number, right? Because Government spending is bigger than taxes. It's a negative number. OK? This is known as a budget deficit. I'm sorry if the slides are slightly different from your handouts. Um, I, I changed this recently. OK? So uh, public saving. This is not public saving. This is the opposite of public saving, right? This is actually killing our savings. When the, bud when the government, think about this. When the government runs a budget deficit, means they spend more money than they take in, they're killing our savings as a country, right? Why is that a problem? Well, when they're killing our savings, they're killing our investment, it means it's killing the amount of capital that we have. So capital's going down, which means productivity is actually going down. So this can be a really big problem, right? Um, let's, let's kind of investigate that, and then we'll take a break. 
Uh, let's suppose that GDP equals $10 trillion. So this would be you know, United States in 1995 or 1990 or something like that. Consumption equals 6.5 trillion. Government spending equals 2 trillion. And there's a budget deficit of 300 billion. Okay? I want you to find public saving, T minus G, right? How much taxes? What's private saving? Y minus C minus G. National saving and investment. And this is easy, right? Investment is always equal to the savings of the whole nation. So it's going to be exactly equal to the same number. Okay? Oops. So go ahead and take a couple minutes and work on this. Um, talk to your friends uh, or talk to me if you have questions. So your first step is definitely going to be figure out how to find taxes. Okay, that's the only tricky part to this. I'll give you a hint. It comes from this line right here, budget deficit of 300 billion. How did you find taxes? What, what did we get for taxes? Yes, because we know that the deficit is equal to taxes minus the government spending, right? So if the budget deficit is 300 billion, right? Let's, let's go ahead and put all these numbers in trillions because the rest of these are in trillions. So 300 billion is 0.3 trillion, right? So we know that point, negative 0.3 is equal to taxes minus the government spending, which is 2 trillion. Okay, so that means that how much is taxes? What minus 2 is equal to negative 0.3? 1.7 trillion dollars. Okay, all right, so work on that. So we got taxes are 1.7 trillion. Um, and then once you have that, then it's kind of easy to find public saving, taxes, private saving, and all those things. Okay, what did we get for public savings? Uh, GDP minus consumption and government. That would, that would be private saving. Public savings is public saving. That's the amount of saving that the government is doing. What is that? Taxes minus... Well, we just so happen to know that taxes minus government spending is negative 0.3 trillion dollars, right? So we know it's negative 0.3 trillion dollars. So always, if the government's running a budget deficit of 300 billion, then public saving is going to be negative 300 billion. If the government is running a budget surplus of 300 billion, public saving would be positive 300 billion. Okay? So that's public saving is negative 0.3 trillion. What about private savings? Now, what's, how do I find private savings? That's my household, right? Yeah. So what is it? It's like GDP Their minus income. Consumption minus tax. Right. GDP minus consumption minus taxes. So we've got GDP is 10 trillion minus consumption is 6.5 minus taxes was, what did we find? Taxes is 1.7. What is that equal to? 1.8. 1.8 trillion dollars. Okay, very good. So private savings, 1.8. So we have the government is saving negative 0.3 trillion. Not so good. The people are saving 1.8 trillion dollars. That's nice. Now I want to save or find national saving. How do I find national savings? Public plus the private, right? So I can just add these two numbers together. Let's do this. National savings is public versus private. And that is equal to 1.8 plus negative 0.3. So I'm just going to subtract it off. 1.5 trillion, okay? Which means that how much are people investing? 1.5 trillion. 1.5 trillion, very good. Because of that cool thing, it just so happens that uh, national savings is always equal to investment, right? So 1.5 trillion, okay? That's excellent. 
Um, so if you look at this, if the government was not running a budget deficit, if the government was running what's called a balanced budget, meaning they have zero, zero surplus and zero deficit, the investment would go up, right? Because look at it. If the government's public saving was zero, balanced budget, right? Then that would mean that national saving would be equal to 1.8 trillion, which would mean that investment is equal to 1.8 trillion. So the idea here is that when the government runs a budget deficit, what happens to investment? Goes down. When this is negative, when the government is running a deficit, however much the deficit is, reduces investment by that same amount. Okay? And, and a way to think of that is this, right? How is the government running a budget deficit? Well, it's borrowing money from people, right? That's how it's running a budget deficit. So some of the savers that used to be sending money to the investors to have productive investment in their companies are sending the money to the United States government instead. Okay? There we go. Okay, so some of the, the savers that were sending money to the financial system before are now sending it to the government for the deficit. And that's why the investment is lower. Okay? So here we go. We have public savings negative 0.3, taxes 1.7, private saving 1.8, national saving 1.5, and investment is equal to um, $1.5 trillion. Okay? So now here's another question for you. How does a tax cut affect savings, national savings, okay? So we kind of have the idea of how it's working here. I want you to suppose that the government cuts taxes by 200 billion. So taxes used to be 1.7, now they're 1.5. Redo the analysis and tell me what happens to investment. But there are two scenarios, okay? Either you save the full proceeds of the tax cut, meaning when you get the tax cut, the extra $200 billion, you just send it right back to the financial system. Or you only save one fourth of it, throw it into the financial system, and then you buy a couple more tacos from Del Taco with the other three fourths of it. Okay? So figure out how that changes investment down here. Okay? So just rerun through the whole analysis, um, but do it twice. One for where the consumers save it all, and then the other one for when they um, only save a quarter of it. Okay, let's do scenario one together. So uh, let's suppose that the government cuts taxes by 200 billion and they save the full proceeds of the tax cut. So let's work through this here, okay? So let's say that under this new scenario, taxes are now only 1.5, right? Because you got 200 billion tax cut means 1.5 trillion is what taxes are. So let's run through public savings. So what's gonna happen to public saving? Well, if taxes go down, then this is going to make this problem even worse, right? And now it's going to be equal to what? Negative 0.5, right? So in other words, the government is running a $500 billion deficit now, right? Now this is a bit of a problem. What's going to happen to private savings, though? This goes down, right, by $200 billion, OK? So that means that this is now going to go up by 200 billion. So this is going to be two trillion dollars. Okay. All right. So then let's go ahead and add these together now. Public plus private. Under this new scenario, we got two minus 0.5 is equal to 1.5 trillion. So what's investment? 1.5 trillion. So, if consumers save everything from the tax cut, does the tax cut help investment at all? No. No, right? Because how much was being invested before? 1.5 trillion. I gave the consumers a 200 billion dollar tax cut. Huge. Did it help the investment at all? No. Investment is still 1.5 trillion. Remember what we're trying to get was we're trying to get this number bigger. We want this number to be higher because when investment goes up, 
then K over L can go up, and then productivity can go up. Our, our economy is in, better, in a better place. So when I made taxes only 1.5 trillion, the thing is, here's what happened. It exactly set each other off, right? People saved more money. The households did, but the government is still spending more money than it takes in. Now, now the government uh, budget deficit is way worse. These set each other off, and you get to the, have the exact same amount of private, of public, excuse me. You have the exact same amount of national savings on the national level as you did before. Basically, all we did was we took a little bit away from the government's saving and we put it on the people's savings, and, but it just exactly cancels each other out. OK, so scenario one, consumers save the full, full proceeds of the tax cut. A tax cut doesn't look like it helps investment at all. OK, let's see what happens, though, if they save one fourth of the tax cut and they spend the other three fourths. OK, we can do that together, too. OK, so taxes go down to 1.5 now. They were at 1.7, now they go down to 1.5. Let's reason this through. What happens to public savings? Well, it's the same thing as before, right? The tax revenue is going down, which makes this thing's going to get even more negative, which means it's at negative 0.5 now. Same as before. But now here's the difference, right? What, what happens to the people? They only save one-fourth of it, and they spend the other three-fourths of it, right? So let's look. Taxes go down by $200 billion, But what do I know about consumption? They spend the other three-fourths of it. So consumption's going up, right? I'm going to spend three-fourths of $200 billion. That's $150 billion, right? So my consumption is going up $150 billion. Right? So you see this partially cancels each other out. Does that make sense? So really, this is now um, going to go, instead of to 2 billion, it's going to go to 1.85, sorry. $1.85 trillion. Right? Because all that, all that happens here. This goes up 150, this goes down 200. So really, this is just going to go up 50 billion, right? Which is just 0.85. Does that make sense? OK. So 1.85. So now I have 1.85 minus 0.5 is equal 1.35 trillion. And what's investment now? 1.35 trillion. Uh-oh, <laughs> that's a problem, right? My investment's actually going down. It was at 1.5 trillion, now it's 1.35 trillion. Okay, what happened? Why did my investment go down with a tax cut? Well, when the consumers saw that they felt like they had more money because the taxes went down, what'd they do? They just started buying a couple more tacos at Del Taco, right? And we know that when people buy more tacos at Del Taco, when their consumption goes up, the savings overall goes down from the economy. OK? So a tax cut can either do nothing for investment, or it can actually make investment go down. So there's, there's your kind of idea of what's going to happen if I have a tax cut. It either does nothing, or it makes it go down, depending upon which is more, more realistic. Now, let me ask you this. OK, so if consumers save the full 200, nothing happens, right? But if consumers save 50 billion and then spend the other 150 billion, the national saving and investment are going to fall by 150 billion. So that's a bad thing, right? Investment fell down by 150 billion dollars. So now it's at 1.35 trillion. Which of the two scenarios do you think is more realistic? Which one of these happens? So to, put, to translate it into you guys' language, you have a job and you make $40,000 a year. The government says, hey, you have a tax cut. Now you get to make $42,000 a year. Not because you're getting paid anymore, it's just they take less out of your paycheck, right? So your afterpay 
Your after-tax paycheck used to be 40,000. Now your after-tax pay is 42,000. What are you probably going to do? Sell more. <laughs> Buy more. Buy more stuff. Exactly. This is very likely, right? It's very likely that you're going to spend maybe even 100% of it, right? And you're going to not probably save it, right? This is probably not true. How many people get a $2,000 bump in their after-tax income and say, oh, I should probably put all of that money in the bank, right? <laughs> How many people do that? Not a whole lot of people. In my opinion, I could be wrong. I don't know. But I think that this is probably more likely, the scenario of people. And so we see that in this scenario, if the government gives a tax cut, then actually that kills investment. It's an interesting idea. It's an interesting problem. Okay. There's one school of thought I should tell you guys about since this is macroeconomics and it's full of silly ideas. That is called Ricardian equivalence. It was thought up by this guy called Ricardo. And really, all I think that this economist, I think he was from Spain, he was trying to come up with a good reason why his government could spend a bunch of money. I think that's why he came up with this. But Ricardian equivalence says that this. If I get a tax cut today, I save 100% of it because I know that if I have a tax cut today, Sometime in the future, my taxes are going to have to go up by the same amount to pay for that budget deficit, right? Because I know that taxes will go up in the future. So this idea came from this economist named Ricardo. Um, it, it doesn't seem very likely to me. How many people actually do this? If you get a tax cut today, you save 100% of it. That's this thing right here, right? Because you know that sometime in the future, if the government's running a budget deficit now, it needs to pay for that deficit sometime in the future. So they're going to ask me for the taxes in the future anyway. So I'm just going to save 100% of it now and put it, in the, put it uh, in the bank. And then when the tax cut goes up, then I'll pay for it then. Okay? That's known as Ricardian equivalence. Uh, basically, if I get a tax cut today, I save 100% of the taxes. Some people believe this. I'm of way more of the opinion that this is actually what happens when people get a tax cut, not this. All right? All right, so we'll continue. Um, and we will go ahead and go back to this idea of the difference between saving and investment. I think we've already talked about it a lot. But I'll just cover it briefly uh, to remind you guys. Remember that private saving is the income remaining after households pay their taxes and pay for consumption, right? Y minus T minus C. That's savings. So households, what can they do with savings? Well, they can, remember, they can send it to the financial system. And they can buy bonds, or they can buy equities, which are, which are stocks, which is the opposite of a bond. Okay? You could get a CD at the bank, so you can put your money in the bank. Okay? You could buy shares of a mutual fund. You could just put it in your savings account or your checking account, right? So this is the households. They're doing what's called saving, even though they're, they're you know, buying mutual funds or they're maybe buying stocks. We're not going to call that investing, even though most people we call investing. Most of the time when you guys say investing, what you're really talking about is saving, right? We rarely talk about actual investing, which is buying pieces of heavy machinery, right? Or capital equipment. It's just kind of outside of our world. But we do talk a lot about savings, even though sometimes we call it investing. So let's just make sure we got our, our words right. Um, so investment is the purchase of new capital, right? That includes human capital, by the way. So you can have an investment in human capital. But mostly we think of as physical capital, large, heavy machinery. Um, or. Uh, this is uh, a new factory, right? If General Motors spends $250 million to build a factory in Michigan, that's investment. If you buy $5,000 worth of computer equipment for your business, right? If it's going to help you produce a good or service, then it is investment, right? And so that's investment. Your parents spend $300,000 to, to build a new house, right? It's kind of a cheap house. Maybe it's, I don't know, in Iowa or something like that. 
But uh, remember, houses, the way we think about houses, they're little factories themselves, and they produce a good called housing. All right? Okay. So anytime that uh, you build a new house or you build a new factory or you buy stuff for your business, that's all investment. And if you think about this, especially these things, you can understand how these are going to increase people's productivity, right? These are good things from the level of the economy as a whole. It's going to make Y over L go up, right? All right, very good. So um, remember, investment is not the purchase of stocks and bonds. If you're buying stocks and bonds, that's savings. Right? Now, the reason why these words get mixed up so often is because, don't forget, they're the exact same amount of money. Right? The amount of money that people save is the exact same amount people invest. That's why it gets mixed up. Right? You actually just maybe save money and you buy stock in GM, in General Motors. Right? Then GM takes your money and uses it to buy a factory, to build a factory. That's the investment. Right? So sometimes when we say, oh, I'm investing in GM, that's not really true. I'm saving. I'm putting my money with GM. GM's taking my money and actually doing the investing for me, right? And that's what kind of where that shortcut comes in, why we call it investing. But does that make sense? OK. So let's think a bit, a bit about uh, what we're going to call the market for loanable funds. So again, this, it, there's a saver over here. There's an investor over here. Somehow the money has to get from one guy to the other, from the saver to the investor. It goes through a marketplace. Okay? That marketplace might be just stocks and bonds. It might be a financial intermediary. But they all have, this, they all have the same sort of characteristics. So we're going to talk about this middle market thing. We're going to call it the market for loanable funds. We're going to explain how it works. Okay? And of course, we're going to use a supply and demand analysis. All right? Money's coming in from the suppliers. That's the savers. Money's being demanded by the investors, right? So obviously we can use supply and demand to look at this to see what happens in the middle. So how does the financial system coordinate saving and investment? That coordinate meaning how does it figure out how much to loan and what at what interest rate? And then, and very importantly, how can government policies affect saving investment in the interest rate? Okay. So that's why we're going to, to, to do It's going to be a super simple model that tries to explain what happens as money goes from the saver to the investor. We're going to try to look at that spot in the middle. OK? OK. Let's assume, for just purposes of our analysis, that there's only one financial market. So maybe it's the market for bonds, or maybe it's the market for stocks, or maybe it's the market uh, for a financial intermediary called the bank, whatever it is that's between the savers and the investors, it's just it's just one thing, okay? And there's this is the only place for savers to put their money, and this is the only place for investors to get their money. Just to make it really simple, okay? We're just going to have one market. Everybody puts their money into it, and everybody has to take money out of it if they want to take money, okay? And so there's one interest rate that means, and it's the same interest rate. The interest rate that you put the money in. As the saver is the same money that the, the loan guy has to take out. Why? Because we're going to like take away the bank and all this stuff. So you're just loaning money directly to the to the investors. So it's the same interest rate. Okay. So where does the supply of the supply curve come from? Savers. Which are who? The households, right? Who saves? The households contribute and they save. Okay? So the households with extra income can loan it out and earn interest. Now, the only, re the only way that we can incentivate or incentivize the households to loan money out is to pay them back some interest rate, right? Otherwise, if they have extra money at the end of the day or the end of the time period, they're going to go out and buy a couple more tacos from Del Taco. They're, they're not going to want to loan this out. You have to encourage them to loan out their money by paying them back some interest rate, right? Um, and in this analysis, both households and member the government can save. Okay? So our supply curve is just the level of national savings. It's the private saving plus, plus the public savings. They form the supply curve for savings dollars. Does that make sense? Okay? The problem, though, is what happens if the government runs a budget deficit? What does that do to the amount of savings available? The government runs a 
Yeah, if the government runs a budget deficit, that means the public saving is negative. That means the total amount of dollars available to be saved goes down. That's going to shift the supply curve to the left. Does that make sense? All right, so let's go ahead and draw the supply curve. So we're going to put always, always, for the supply curve, we put price and quantity, right? So quantity, what's quantity? Just the number of billions of dollars of loans that people make. And what's the price of a loan? The interest rate, right? If I want to go get a loan from somebody, I have to pay them some price. It's called the interest rate. So I'm not going to put P on this axis. I'm going to put the interest rate. All right? And then I'm going to draw a supply curve just like always. All right? Remember, the supply curve is who in the market for loanable funds? Household. Households, mostly households, or the government savings. Right. Public and private savings. OK, now why is it upward sloping? Well, all supply curves are upward sloping. But why does this make sense here? Imagine, if I tell you, hey, you can get 3% for your money. Maybe 60 people want to save $60 billion at the end of the year to go ahead and, and, uh, and loan out. But what happens if all of a sudden you can get 6% for your money? What's this going to do to people? It's going to make them want to save more so they can loan out more money, right? Does that make sense? So this is just a shift along the same supply curve. If I only have 3%, you know, if I'm the, if I'm the household and people tell me, yeah, you can get 3% on your money, maybe they want to loan out 60 billion. But if I say, oh, no, you can get 6% on your money now, all kinds of people are going to start trying to loan the money out. And so there's going to be $80 billion available, right? So the idea here is an increase in the interest rate makes saving more attractive, which increases the quantity of loanable funds supplied, right? What's going to happen is these households, if I know I can make 6% on my money, the households are going to be like, oh, I'm buying fewer tacos at Del Taco today because I'm going to go loan this money out. Because I can make 6% on my money, right, now? But when the, if the interest rate's only 3%, people are like, eh, it's not really worth it. I'll just keep eating my tacos from Del Taco. OK, does that make sense? So that's why the supply curve shifts up. <clears throat> it's very important to remember that an increase in the interest rate does not shift the supply curve, right? Does not shift the supply curve. This is like the, the amount of funds available in total, right? So if the government runs a budget deficit, that's not a shift in the interest rate. That is the entire supply curve moves backwards and, and goes down, goes lower, right? If the, budget, if the government runs a budget deficit. Because the government, when it runs a budget deficit, what's it doing? It's sucking out some of that savings money to use for itself. Okay, So, so the supply goes up. OK. Now, let's think about who are the demanders in the market for loanable funds? Who take loans out from the market? It's these investors on this side, right? It's the firms. Okay? So the firms borrow the funds they need to pay for new equipment, factories, whatever it is that they're going to invest the money in, right? whatever investments they're going to make. They're going to buy capital. They're going to buy maybe new tractors. I don't know what it is. But um, firms are going to borrow the funds they need. And also, here's the other people who borrow from the market for loanable funds, households. Why? Because they ha they, the only kind of factory most households purchase is what? Their house, right? So remember, over here on this side where I had uh, the, the firms that are taking out money, I also had houses, right? So houses are getting money from here. So it's very simple. We got savers and the government that's putting money into the market. And then we have households and firms taking the money out of it to make investments. All right, so let's draw this demand curve. The demand curve slopes down. Why does it slope down? Well, it always slopes down. But why does it make sense in the market for loanable funds? Well, look, if you tell me the interest rate is 7%, that's kind of high, I'm only going to want to take out $50, million, $50 billion from you, right? But then if the, market, the interest rate falls to 4%, what am I going to want to do? I'll take out more loans because I can, I can afford more, right? So it makes it more attractive. So fall in the interest rate reduces the cost of borrowing, which increases the quantity of loanable funds demanded. Okay? This is not a shift of the demand curve. Right? How would we shift the demand curve? Well, let's imagine that more companies open up. Right? More firms open up. So more firms need to borrow money to build factories. 
that will shift the demand curve, right? If more firms open up. But just uh, if the existing number of firms, I know that if I charge them less for the money, if I make them only pay 4%, they're going to be like, oh, wow, now I can loan money not only to build one factory, or borrow money not only to build one factory, but now I can build two factories because I can afford it. So I'm going to borrow more money. All right? So that's how the demand for loanable funds works. Okay? Quick review. Who are the suppliers in the market for loanable funds? Households or government saving. Households or government saving, right. Who are the demanders? In the market, firms or, household want to buy new houses. firms or households that want to buy houses. Very good. Okay, so this is what we always do in economics. We just look at where the two lines cross, right? And then we call that an equilibrium. Okay, so the equilibrium adjusts so that the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded, right? This is what always happens. The price goes either up or down to match exactly the quantity supplied to the quantity demanded. OK? Imagine that, that's what I, this is what I was just saying, the equilibrium quantity of loanable funds equals equilibrium investment and equilibrium savings, right? Because savings is the supply curve. That's the savings, the people supplying it. The investment is the demand curve. The point where savings is equal to investment is equal to the equilibrium quantity. And then it finds the interest rate that makes that true. Imagine the interest rate was too high, some, some reason that it got set too high. I don't know who's setting this, but let's say there's some guy in charge of the market and he sets it. Well, that's going to make everybody want to loan money out, right? The high interest rate, look, if you come into the supply, it's going to make a really big number. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, I'm sending my money to the marketplace to get loaned out because it, it's a super great return. But the demanders, it's going to be a low number because they're over here. They're like, oh, man, I can't really afford this. This is too expensive. Right? In which case, there's all this extra money sitting around in the marketplace, not enough people taking loans. So what's that going to do to the interest rate? It's going to make it go down to try to entice people to take more loans. Okay? So that's how the interest rate goes up and down, just like price. Right? This looks exactly the same as every other supply and demand curve intersection that we've ever seen. And it acts the exact same. Right? If you push the price down too low, it will come back up. Right? If you push the price up too high, we have too much supply, and then the, and the price will come back down. It works the exact same way. And you can shift the curves, and the equilibrium will change. But this is just a real simple way to understand how the money works as it passes from the savers to the investors. Okay? So let's imagine that we have some sort of saving incentive. So the government says, I know what I want to do. I want to increase investment. Because why do we want to increase investment? Well, because that makes K over L go up, which makes Y over L go up, right? So the government says, I want to increase investment. So what I could do is, so I need to get a higher number of loanable funds loaned. Let's move the supply curve, right? Because we know what happens. If I, if I move the supply curve, I'm going, to have a new, I'm going to have a new equilibrium down here, right? So the investment goes up because I move the supply curve. What, what kind of investment or what kind of incentive that could they do? Maybe this is a tax incentives for saving. It will increase the supply of loanable funds. Okay. Maybe the government says, hey, consumers, households, if you spend money on consumption, you have to pay taxes on that. But if you spend money on saving or if you save your money, you don't have to pay taxes on that. Okay. Maybe the government says that. What's that going to do? That's going to make people want to save more money because they don't have to pay taxes on it, right? Anybody here uh, heard of a 401k or any sort of individual retirement account, right? What does that, what does an IRA, a traditional IRA do? It says if you take your money and you save it and put it in this IRA, you don't have to pay taxes on it, right? Up to $5,000 or $5,500 a year, I think, something like that. Right? That's what a 401k does or a traditional IRA. Right? You take your money and the government says, if you, if you take this dollar and you go spend it on Del Taco, you're paying taxes on it. But if you take this money and if you go save it and put it in some stocks and bonds here, you don't have to pay taxes on it. Right? 
That's what, the, what's what a 401k is, a, or a, a traditional IRA. That moves the supply curve up, right? So it does two things, two really nice things. What does it do to the, the amount of investment? It increases it. What does it do to the interest rate? It drops it, right? So it makes it, the falling interest rate makes it more attractive for firms to take out more loans for good things, right? For investment. Because that's what we want to happen. We want investment to increase, right? So it increases the, sorry, it decreases the equilibrium interest rate and increases the equi equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. Okay, so this idea that the government had, I want to increase investment because I want to increase K over L. So how do I make investment go up? Well, one of the ways they did it was by bringing the supply curve out. Okay, so there's a bunch of different ways that the government could make people more willing to save. Another way they can do this is by um, having a budget surplus, right? If the government has extra money left over at the end of the year, it gets saved too, which would be the same thing as moving the supply curve out, right? All right, so that's one way to increase the investment. What's the other curve that I could move? Demand curve, okay? So let's imagine that we do that. We try to make people, the demanders, invest more. So let's say that um, the government tells the firms, hey, if you guys you take out a loan and you use money to, uh, to build a new factory, you don't have to pay taxes on that money, right? Maybe the government says that. What's that going to do? That's going to make the firms want to borrow more money. Yes? Yes. Exactly. So the government is saying, hey, you guys, if you, if you invest, you don't have to pay taxes on that money, but if you take that money and do anything else with it, you still have to pay taxes on that, okay? That makes the demand curve go up. So what does that do? Well, it for sure increases investment, but this time it increases the interest rate. Okay? But the same goal is accomplished in both times. It's increased the amount of investment, increased the number of dollars that were loaned out. Well, that's what we want, to increase the amount of loanable funds. Okay? So in both situations, the loanable funds were increased, investment went up, either I move D or I move S, it doesn't really matter. It does change what happens to the interest rate, right? And perhaps the government, if they're choosing, which one of these do I want to move, right? They're going to think about, well, do I want the interest rate to go up or down, right? Before the government decides whether to change the D curve or the S curve, okay? Okay, any questions? Okay, let's have you guys uh, practice. I want you to draw the loanable funds. I want you to draw an original supply, original demand, and an original equilibrium, right? And then after you draw the original equilibrium, I want you to imagine that the, the government has a budget deficit. What curve moves and what happens to the equilibrium? So you have to tell me what happens to the price and what happens to the quantity, okay? And draw the new curve. All right, so you should have an original equilibrium looking like that, and then see what happens. Which curve shifts when the government runs a budget deficit, and which direction does it shift? I kind of have already helped you out with this a little bit. OK. What curve shifts when the government runs a budget deficit? Supply moves to the left. Excellent. Now, who can tell me why that happens? Like, what's the kind of the economic intuition? Why does supply move here? Right. If the government is running a budget deficit, that means it doesn't have enough money to cover its basic operations. That means they're sucking up money to pay, like, they're still paying for those operations, but they're sucking up money from the savers, right? So there's less money available for saving, which makes the supply curve go back, all right? And so what does that do to the new equilibrium? Please tell me. What happens to quantity? Very good. And what happens to interest rate? Excellent. So we have quantity falling, interest rate rising. Hey, is this a good thing in terms of our production model? When investment falls, tell me what's going to happen. If investment falls kind of 
go through all the steps? What's going to end up happening for our people? Who remembers? If investment falls, what's going to happen to the amount of capital in our society? Drop. drop. So what's going to happen to the level of K over L in our society? It's going to drop. Which is go what is going to happen then to Y over L in our society? Drop. drop. Which Y over L is how productive the people are and how well off they are. Right? The welfare of the people. So if I have this incidence, then the people are worse off. Right? This is super, super important, and it's called crowding out, and you have to have to know. This is one of the big ideas from macroeconomics. Okay? Really, honestly, if you only learn one thing from this chapter, I want you to learn this. Crowding out. When the government runs a budget deficit, it crowds out other investment. Right? The government's sucking up some of these loanable funds that could be loaned to companies so they could do productive things, right? But the government is sucking up this money and it's crowding out private investment. Okay? So the government is actually causing a decrease in investment because its own budget deficit is crowding out the, um, the investment that's done by private companies. Okay? So that's a big problem. Like we've seen, then the levels of capital go down and K over L go down and all that stuff, okay? So there's the, there's the idea. You don't have to have these actual numbers just as long as you know that Q is going down and interest rates going up, okay? So this is idea this, uh, of crowding out. An increase in the budget deficit causes a fall in investment. We just used our, our, uh, our model to show that, right? So. Here's basically the idea here. The government is borrowing to finance the deficit. The government's spending more than the taxes are getting. So they have to get the money somewhere. So they're sucking the money out of the market for loanable funds. They're sucking it out of the pockets of people who would supply it anyway. There's less funds available for investment. Okay, That's the crowding out idea. And this is a big problem because we need K over L to go up in the long run. We need K over L to go up. Because that's one of the main ways that Y over L goes up. But when the government is, is sucking up money from the savers to run its own budget deficit problems, then there's not the same level of investment available. So K over L falls and Y over L falls. So in the long run, budget deficits are tremendously hurtful to the economy. Tremendously hurtful All right, in the long run. Well, in the short run, too, sometimes. But in the, the reason why people run budget deficits, because in the short run, it feels good. The government's spending a bunch of money right now. And I'm like, oh, I, I get this like little jolt. Our economy gets this little jolt from the government spending just in this year, right? But the problem is, in the long run, it kills the economic growth because the, there's not enough investment going on because the government is crowding out the dollars. It's sucking up the money. Okay. OK, so let's look at how our government is doing as far as its budget deficit. I think you guys kind of probably already know. I'll give you a spoiler alert. We're running a budget deficit right now. <laughs> so how does the government finance the deficit? Well, the government actually borrows money. It actually sells what are called government bonds, which, remember, are just IOUs. So how does the government pay for its budget deficit? It says, hey, give me some money. I'll give you an I IOU. I promise in the future I'll pay you back, man. Right? That's what a government bond is. And that's what happens. Um, that's how the government finances its deficit. And so if you have a deficit year after year, it starts to add up. right? And we call that the debt. So I want you to know there's two different things going on here. One is if every year the government doesn't doesn't have enough money, like let's say it doesn't have $100 billion enough, then it borrows it, right? Then it borrows it. Then there's the total amount of money it has ever borrowed. That's called the debt. OK? So let's say that next year, just for one reason, for, for some reason or another, next year the government runs a budget surplus. It has $100 billion extra dollars at the end of the year. OK? That wouldn't take away the debt, because we still have all of this leftover debt that we've accumulated from years and years and years, right? 
We could take that $100 billion and start paying off the debt, but it's going to take a long time to pay off the debt. Okay? So when we hear um, talking about the budget, uh, a lot of times, there, so there's two, two different dollar values we're thinking about. We're thinking about We're thinking about the debt, which right now is about $14 trillion. That's the total amount of money that the government has ever borrowed and hasn't paid back yet, $14 trillion. But then there's this deficit, and that's just how much each year that we're not making enough of, how much money we're short each year. And this is somewhere between 300, historically has been 300, 500 billion in the last couple of years. Okay, does that make sense? So every year I get to the end of the year and I, I have a $300 billion deficit. Well, it just gets added on to this right here and this is going to be 14.3 trillion at the end of the next year. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then even if, if we get a, a, some good money managers in the government and they start having surpluses, and they start saving 100 or 200 billion extra dollars, they're going to go start paying this off. It's going to take forever to pay this guy off, right? That makes sense? OK. So sometimes uh, people look at the ratio of government debt to GDP to see how indebted the country is, right? So they're going to look at this number here, the debt to GDP ratio, OK? Um, and so normally, the debt to GDP ratio rises during wartime, meaning the government runs very high budget deficits during war, and then during peacetime, it starts paying those off. That's happened in our economy for many years, up until the 80s. In the 80s, what started happening? People just started having budget deficits, and then they just kept having budget deficits, and they, stopped, they just didn't even start paying off the debt at all. Okay, And that happened in the 80s. So let me show you what this looks like. Right? The Revolutionary War, it's kind of when our country started, we had a huge high debt to GDP ratio. right? But then after the Revolutionary War, people started paying off the debt. The other thing that started happening is because this is just debt to GDP. The other thing that happens to make this go low is GDP gets high. right? It's not that big of a deal for a country to have $1 trillion in debts if the company makes $14 trillion of GDP. It is a big deal for the country to have $1 trillion in debts if the company only makes $800 billion in GDP, right? If there's more debt than it even makes an entire year, that's a big issue, right? So a lot of people say sometimes this 100% GDP debt ceiling is a, is, is a place you just never want to cross, right? So the Revolutionary War, people started paying off the debt, or the government started paying off the debt, but GDP also started increasing. So it got very low. Look, we had zero debt right here. That's pretty awesome. Civil War, boom. Why did this increase? Well, there was a lot of w expenditures for the war, right? We had to spend all kinds of money for the war. Um, but we didn't want to raise taxes all of a sudden because that would hurt the economy too, too quickly, right? So the government said, that's OK. We'll just go ahead and pay for this war out of debt, right? So they just took loans for the wars, the other, in other words. And this has happened through all of the wars, the Civil War, and then it went back down. World War I, we took out a bunch of loans to pay for World War I, then got, debt went down. World War II, wow, that was really expensive, right? Really expensive. We were actually more, we owed more money than the entire GDP, right? Because it's over 100%. We owed more money than the entire GDP was. But then we started paying it off, and it wasn't that bad. We paid it off, and GDP increased, right? So it's not that big of a deal. But then all of a sudden during the 80s, we started spending, right? Um, Ronald Reagan had this big, huge round of tax cuts. So what happens when your taxes go down? Well, our budget deficits start going up. We didn't stop spending money, right? For a brief period of time, in the early 1990s, 1993, 1994, something like that, under the Clinton administration, we had budget surpluses for the first time in a lot of years, right? We actually started saving money, and the government did. And at the same time, GDP was growing, so it made this fall. But then since then, ooh, look at this. It's shot back up. We're, as, of, as of 2011, we were at about 80% of GDP. We're actually a little higher now. Um, the problem is, is that 
this was caused by financial crisis and like some wars, but how, how much is the war on terror really a war? Um, you know, it's a huge expenditure, right? But then are we gonna have the same sort of end to the war where we can start paying off this debt? Or does it look like the, the new kind of war, the war on terror, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan might be like permanent expenditures, right? So that won't give us the opportunity to start paying them off. So this is a big problem, why? Because when the debt to GDP ratio goes up like this, then there's no money left over. The government's sucking up all the extra money from the savers, right? So there's no extra money to go into the investors for, to, to make K over L go up, okay? So this would be a huge example of why United States GDP growth is slow. Why is it slow? Because K over L is not growing because there's no extra money for K, right? So if K is not growing, then GDP is not growing. And that's why over the past, one of the reasons perhaps over the past couple of years that, that uh, GDP has not been growing, okay? So conclusion, then we'll be all done. Financial markets are governed by supply and demand. So I can draw a supply and demand curve for my financial markets. Um, remember, generally, I like marketplaces. As long as, as there's a lot of buyers, a lot of sellers, there's no like monopolists in the market, it's a good, efficient outcome, right? And so financial markets are very helpful, especially those financial intermediaries, the mutual funds and the banks. They help incentivate or encourage people to, savers to, to contribute money so the investors can invest it, okay? And the other cool thing that financial markets do is they link the present to the future. So not only is it linking the savers to the investors today, right? It's also linking you to your future self. If you save some money now in the future, you get to go ahead and take it back out, right? And you can have increased um, consumption in the future. So they enable savers to convert current incomes into future purchases, right? I can take my money now and change it into future purchases by putting it in the financial markets, okay? It allows borrowers, borrowers the ability to get money to acquire capital goods um, and, and services as well, okay? So we call this the intertemporal um, function of, of the ca capital markets, right? It can change, it can link you to your future self, okay? Any questions on savings, investment, and the thing that links them, the financial system? <laughs>